Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Ali Dadvakili. I'm going to be talking today about how to position your startup for venture capital funding. We are waiting for a few more folks to join in, so bear with us. We will get going in about 30 seconds or so. Okay, well, again, thank you for everyone for um, signing up and attending. We're going to run through a quick overview. I'll give an intro of myself and uh, Foley and Lardner, and we will dive right into the material. We've got a hour and a half. I'll try to reserve about half an hour or so for questions. So certainly welcome questions, thoughts, comments. If you've gone through some experience you want to share, um, we have the chat that's uh, available to, to um, provide any information or ask questions. Uh, some people ask questions throughout the presentation. I'll try to answer those if it looks like it ties into what I'm talking about at the moment. I, I'll probably try to save most of the questions towards the end so we can kind of run through them. But uh, do welcome questions uh, with regard to anything that is covered here. So just a quick disclosure and some housekeeping. This is really an educational uh, presentation. I'm going to be talking a lot of about a lot of high level legal concepts and issues. Don't want anyone to walk away thinking I'm giving legal advice. Obviously, you know, facts and circumstances are very, very critical in any any time you're trying to plan for something with regard to a, a financing or corporate type legal issue. So certainly encourage you if you've got a particular issue you want to talk to me about to reach out separately. I'll provide my email and contact information towards the end so you'll have that. But this is not intended to be legal advice. And anything that I say here should not be relied upon without obviously, you know, reaching out to me for for specific legal advice separately or a lawyer that can assist you and guide you. So just a very quick overview of the agenda. Let's go back one slide, please. Yeah, there we go. This is the, the topics I'll be covering. I'll do a little background overview of, of the, the um, presentation. We'll talk about some structural considerations, how to set your company up with the right entity type and jurisdiction to be in the best position and the most attractive position for investors. What are some of the, the early documentation issues that are critical to make sure you have covered? What are the different financing options that are available as you get going with your startup and are looking for bringing in capital to help with um, development of the IP technology, uh, commercialization of that. What are the issues, pros and cons, and some things to be thinking about with regard to convertible securities? So typically your safes or your convertible notes. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about valuation and dilution, what to be thinking about and, and to really pay attention to. We'll talk about sort of the overview of venture capital financing in general at a high level. What's the process? What's the procedure? What sort of things should you be thinking about and be aware of? Another topic which um, I've added this to this presentation, I've done this presentation a few times before, but one of the things that I see over and over again is that I think would be helpful is a little discussion about getting yourself in what I call investment ready. So what do you need to do to put yourself, the company in the best position so that you've got everything ready to go? So as soon as you have a term sheet, you've got an investor that's interested in investing, you can very quickly get going with the process. And there isn't any any sort of delay because you don't have a data room, you don't have your documents organized, things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. How do you prepare for a, an effective closing? And at the very end, we'll talk about some common pitfalls that I've seen, sort of trips and, and traps for the unwary, hopefully giving you a little bit of guidance to avoid some of those and save yourself a huge headache. And then we'll open it up for, for Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. So a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a cor corporate attorney with Foley and Lardner. I've um, been practicing for over 20 years. Um, a lot of my work is, is primarily focused on representing uh, startups and emerging growth um, companies, as well as investors. So I, I represent both the, the company side and the investor side. And it's really from the company side, it's it's everything from A to Z, as I say, from startup to liquidity or, or from garage to global. It's helping set up the company. It's helping advise founders on how to allocate equity, how to set up all their documentation, and then helping them through the whole process as they, as they scale and grow. So it's the financing piece. It's helping them manage all of the other issues that will come up with regard to when to get, you know, my colleagues from the employment practice involved as far as employment issues, or executive benefit issues with regard to how to properly plan an equity incentive plan all the way through exit. Um, so it's a whole, whole life cycle. 
love working with startups, love working with founders, entrepreneurs, love working with investors. It, it's a great ecosystem. One of the things that is always really interesting and, and um, fascinating for me is just the passion, the innovation, the ideas that people come up with, which sometimes are, are very common sense. The, the sort of reaction you have is like, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of that? But there's also some incredibly sophisticated, complicated, really cool technology that people have created. And it's just, it's fascinating and, and really rewarding to be a part of it. So love working with, with um, startups and investors in this community and the ecosystem. Next, I always like to give, give quotes. Quotes sometimes can sum up what someone could say in, in a few minutes or even longer. But, you know, preparation is, is really key. I, I, I'm sure a lot of founders and entrepreneurs already know that. But you know, this was a good one I liked. Before anything else, preparation is the key to success. So if you prepare properly, you're setting yourself up for the best chances of, of having a successful um, outcome. So a little bit about Foley and Lardner. Um, I joined Foley a little while ago and can tell you it's a full service firm. We practice in a lot of different areas. We do a lot of work with startups and emerging growth companies. We do a lot of work with more mature companies. And we really can scale and grow as the businesses scale and grow. We represent a lot of very, very large multinational corporations as well. Uh, and, and, the, and the range of services we provide runs the gamut from the corporate to IP litigation, um, technology transactions, data privacy. So there, there probably isn't too much that you could throw at us that we couldn't handle and do and do very well. The firm's got 180 year history, been around for a very, very long time, have about 25 offices, um, Big presence in the U.S. We have also uh, presence out overseas as well. Do a lot of inbound work coming into the U.S. from overseas, and obviously a, a huge national practice as well. Next, this lists a couple of, of the, the areas that we cover. I'm not going to go through it and, and take too much time now, but um, anything related to a lot of what the startups are focusing on and working on, whether it's healthcare, you know, pure tech, SaaS-based businesses, data privacy, et cetera. We we have a lot of deep experience in all of those areas. Next. So jumping right into the discussion here, one of the first considerations I think is really critical to be thinking about is structuring your company in the right way. And, and what I mean by that is primarily two issues. One is making sure that you're setting up the entity in the, in the right type. And the second issue is where you should be setting up your entity. And many of you have probably heard about you know, Delaware being sort of the preeminent state in the U.S. for setting up your entity. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the first considerations is is making sure you choose the right entity. So there are a lot of different types of business entities you could choose from. But by far and large, if you're a startup that is going to go out and, and seek financing from third parties, especially venture capital uh, financing, then you really want to be setting your company up as a, a Delaware C corporation. And, and the C refers to a section in the IRS um, code that dictates how that corporation is taxed. And essentially, it's it's a it's a entity that will be taxed at the corporate level, and that is what is typically preferred by by most investors. It, it is a corporation, so it has all of the bells and whistles of, of the corporate forum, the protection from liability. You've got a very sort of structured uh, management um, that's not only uh, managed and governed by the documents that control and set up the organization, but also under the Delaware Code, uh, very well drafted, very well thought out. So it's it's very well known and very understood and um, uh, liked by the investors. But if you've also been around companies and startups, um, it's it's very easy to understand the different processes and management rights and, and decisions and responsibilities and obligations. So it's it's a very good form for setting up your company. And oftentimes investors will insist on having a, a C corporation. Delaware being the primary state where most of these companies are set up, especially startups that are going to be seeking financing. Just some quick fact uh, trivias for you is most publicly traded companies in the U.S. are actually formed as Delaware companies. So you have a lot of very large companies that, that established themselves in Delaware as the jurisdiction. It's the if there's a dispute and you're in Delaware, you typically will go before the Chancery Court, which is um, seated by uh, judges that are very experienced with business law. They that's all they do. They only hear business cases. So they're very, very knowledgeable in business law. So you're going to be going before a judge that's going to understand the issues, will understand the laws relating to the business. And therefore, you have a much better chance of the judge understanding the issues, understanding the complexities and being able to render uh, a good decision. 
It's also the the laws that the Delaware uh, General Corporation law is reviewed on a regular basis. It's updated on a regular basis. The Secretary of State in Delaware is very easy to work with. So there's a lot of reasons to choose Delaware as your preeminent state. But the primary one is investors oftentimes will insist on it. So here's another topic that I think is is really important to and um, just want to make sure we have the chat. We should have the chat open. So you know, as as I go through the presentation, if you do have questions, um, feel free to to put those into the chat. I do get questions oftentimes on these presentations about will the link be made available? Will there be a recording? This is being recorded, and you will be sent the link to attend the or to watch the video. If you didn't get a chance to watch the full video, or if you wanted to go back and, and look at something again, you will definitely uh, receive a link with the um, recording. So you'll be able to see that if you miss anything um, on today's presentation. So with that said, talking about documentation for founders and early personnel, and, and this is an area where I see a lot of companies make some footfalls because they're geared up and anxious to develop the technology, to get out there and start commercializing so that they can start driving revenue. And sometimes the, you know, getting the right documentation in place with the early folks is sort of thought of as, as a secondary item where, oh yeah, we'll get to it. We know, we know the deal. We understand amongst ourselves, the founders that, you know, this is how we're doing things and we'll worry about getting it documented later. Or I've oftentimes seen the scenario where they don't want to spend the money to go talk to a lawyer and get it done properly. And so they just either grab something off of a Google search or some, somewhere else, a friend gave them a document that they used for their business and they adapted that and used it. What I would say and what I would caution to everyone is, is make sure you do get good legal advice. These are really critical documents and agreements that if not done properly in the beginning, can cause tremendous havoc on the company down the road. And I'll go through some of those right now. So confidentiality agreements goes without you know, too much uh, explanation. If you're gonna be talking to anyone, whether they're going to be early employees, whether they're going to be a consultant you're going to be working with, a vendor, potential, but you know, anyone that you're going to be going and talking about the technology that you've come up with or your, you know, so, so-called secret sauce, make sure you're thinking about do I need to get a confidentiality agreement in place? Especially if you're going to be bringing someone into doing work for the company, you definitely want to make sure you have a confidentiality agreement so that whatever is disclosed, whatever is discussed, Whatever is provided is going to be kept confidential, or at least you've got an, a document confirming that. What goes hand in hand with that is for um, founders as well as employees and consultants, you also want to get in place what's called a CIIAA or PIIAA. It's, it, what it means is it's Confidential Information Invention Assignment Agreement, I know it's a mouthful, and a Proprietary Information Invention Assignment Agreement. Those to mean the same thing. It basically refers to agreement that you would sign with founders as well as early employees, all employees, all consultants, that essentially says you're coming to work and, and participate and contribute. So whatever information is created, disclosed, provided is going to be confidential. But also whatever you create for the company, whether it's creating technology, whether it's improving technology, adding the technology, whatever that is that you're creating that relates to the business, that's going to belong to the business. And I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this for a second because this is a really critical point. If you bring someone into your company and they help develop, let's say, being in the Silicon Valley area, it's a tech company, and you've got this source code that is really going to be the most valuable asset that the company will have. If you hire someone to do the coding for that and develop that code, and you don't get them to sign this kind of an agreement, and they walk away, they will walk away with some ownership in what they've created because they actually created it. And if you don't get them to sign off and, and transfer that over to the company, you've got a real potential issue because then when you go to scale and grow your company, you don't have the rights to use that core technology that is so critical to your business. So having these agreements in place from the very beginning will save a huge headache and potentially save the company from, from basically not being able to go any further because you don't have the rights to do what you came up with um, to develop. Investors are going to look for that as well. That's one of the top things on their list when they do their diligence. So making sure that that those forms are in place. They're easy to do. We do them all the time. We oftentimes when we have a, an engagement with the startup, we will provide those. We'll provide it at the, the drafts of them for the founders, early employees. We'll provide a form for the, um, the company to use so they can use that form that we've prepared 
for other employees and personnel coming into the company. Enough said on that, let's move on to vesting of security. So oftentimes with founders, obviously, with early employees and consultants, you're going to be issuing stock or stock options. You want to make sure that you've done it in a way where there is some protection for the company if that person leaves. And this applies to founders as well as employees and consultants. And typically what you do is you restrict a stock or you uh, or the, and the options so that there is a vesting schedule that the, the stock, there'll be a repurchase right the company has to buy the stock back from the person you gave it to, founder, employee, consultant, doesn't matter, if they leave before the stock is fully vested. And I've seen this come up and, and be really important because two founders get together, they form the company and everything's going well. After three or four months, one of the founders says, you know what, I'm not really interested. I've, I've got an offer to go with this company. It's going to pay me a ton of money. I don't want to go do that. Great. They take off. But guess what? When you set up the company, you you basically divvied up the, the equity in the company 50-50. So now they walk away with 50% of the shares in the company, but they're no longer contributing to the company's success. Big, big problem. Now, if, if you have the proper vesting in place in the agreements, what would typically happen if they leave within that three-month period, nothing's vested. So the company would then be able to repurchase all of the stock that the founder got for the same price they paid for it, which typically is pretty low because of the early onset of the company's formation. There is no value, generally speaking. So it's the same purchase price they paid. It's really low. The company sends them a check for a few bucks. They get all the stock back. Founder walks away, does what you know he or she wants to do. But now the company is, is, is protected its cap table, protected its ownership, and taken back that 50%. Super critical. Also very important for employees and uh, consultants. And even though employees and consultants will oftentimes get a much smaller portion of, of the equity as it's being allocated, it's still really important to make sure that they have that the, the vesting in place so it can be repurchased or that the on the option side, it has invested so they can actually exercise to purchase it. So if they were to leave, the unvested options basically disappear. They're gone. So you don't have to worry about that. Transfer restrictions are really important too. Um, you should be thinking about, do we need a shareholder agreement between the founders? So sometimes you'll see that if it's going to be a while before there's a financing, you want to have something in place that covers scenarios that might come up, contingencies such as death, divorce, disability, retirement, where if something happens to one of the founders, there is at least a mechanism that's that's governed in a, an agreement that handles and provides a process for how to manage that. Bylaws, which are sort of the operating manual for the company, there may be restrictions in those as far as you know, anyone that's got stock can't transfer it without the company having the right to at least um, buy that first to keep those shares with the company. And then stock purchase agreements, of course, that's where for founders, you would have the restrictions in place so that if the founder had stock, they purchased the onset, if they left, those repurchase rights would be in that agreement. And really quickly, I, one question came in, is an S corp not the preferred option from a taxation perspective? So really quickly, let me address that, and, and then we'll move on. So there are there are two different types of corporations. There is a C corporation that I mentioned. There is also something called an S corporation, and again, it refers to the chapter in the IRS code that, that talks about how that particular type of corporation is taxed. It's the same. It's the same type of corporation, same features, same management, the same laws apply to it as far as you know um, obligations, responsibilities, things like that. What's different though is it's taxed differently. It, it's called a pass-through tax structure so that the S corporation doesn't pay any tax at the corporate level. So at the corporate level, the money comes in and it's passed all the way down through to the individual shareholders. So you avoid the level of, of taxation at the corporate level and you only have one level of corporation which is down at the shareholder, the owner level. So yes, it is is typically better or more advantageous from a tax perspective, however, Investors, especially funds, venture capital funds, don't like that structure and, in fact, don't will not invest in that structure oftentimes because of that pass-through um, structure. They don't want that pass-through to go to the actual funds that they've got investments from that are then making the investment into the startup. So for, for their purposes, they don't like that structure. They don't want to pass through. They want to have the C, the C corporate structure. And even though there is two levels of taxation, if you're very good about your accounting and you've got a good tax accountant, um, they can oftentimes, you know, uh, take advantage of deductions, business expenses, et cetera. So they can try to minimize that uh, that tax impact. 
Okay, so let's talk about financing options. There's a lot of different ways that you can finance your company. I didn't include all of them because it would take too long to go through them. And I want to make sure we're covering a lot of other issues. So obviously, oftentimes the founders will bootstrap the initial formation and other things that need to get done out of their own pockets called bootstrapping. You know, if, if the founders have the wherewithal to be able to bootstrap as long as they can, that's probably the preferred way to go because you maintain as much control as you can until you really have to go out and raise financing from from other investors but oftentimes the, the founders don't have the the financial means so they need to go out and raise capital from from third parties so oftentimes initially at the very early stages you'll see companies looking to do convertible notes or safes and i'll talk a little bit about those and then a little bit later than that usually not all, not always is when they'll actually go out and sell stock, usually preferred stock to investors. And that's when you'll see your series C, series A, series B, et cetera. But the convertible notes and the safes are oftentimes much easier to document and create, less expensive from from the company's perspective, so much easier to to manage that budget and expense. And, you know, takes less time. So you can very quickly prepare those documents to go out and talk to investors to get funds into the company using a convertible note or a safe. There are other other avenues as well. Sometimes you can apply for grants from, you know, state or or federal governments um, or sometimes private companies. Loans are probably not going to be something that a startup is going to be able to get because you have to have collateral and you have typically lenders are looking for revenue. Not always, but but oftentimes are. So that's usually a little bit later stage that we see that. But again, another option. So talking about convertible securities, and and basically what that means is a a security, a company that can convert into equity. So the the two most common ones typically that we see with startups is the convertible note and the safe. And basically those two instruments, you would have those signed by the investors, company signs it, then the investors put in the money, the capital that they're investing. And at some point in the future, when you're doing your priced equity round, as we call it, where you're actually selling stock, generally that's when they will convert into shares of the type that is being sold to the investor in that priced equity round. And there'll be some conversion features and some some other aspects of the convertible note or the safe that'll dictate what it converts into at, at what sort of price or what sort of conversion ratio so that you figure all that out when you close your priced equity round those instruments will convert into shares of that round. So some of the some of the pros of doing it is, as I mentioned, um, they're easy to document, they're less expensive. The other pro, which is which is something to think about, especially in today's landscape where valuations have t- typically been depressed, um, is you avoid having to, to do a valuation. You, you don't need to have a pre-money valuation assigned to the company because you're not actually issuing stock at the time you take in the investments via a convertible note or a safe. That decision, that valuation point is pushed down the road until you have your priced equity round at which time those convertible securities will convert. Once you go to do your priced equity round, that's when you will have to establish a a valuation for the company. But that can give you a, a nice window so you don't have to value now. So given where we are now with, with valuations being down, if you can do your financing and get enough and build a long enough runway to last for six, eight, 12 months or, or whatever the time period is, you know, hopefully as, as, as the market starts to recalibrate and get back to what is more of a normal sense of valuations of what we've seen in the past, then when you go to raise at that point in time, you'll be able to get a better valuation which obviously means you know the company will be able to negotiate a better better deal on its investment than it might be able to do so now. So that's a, that's a huge advantage, and we've seen a lot of companies take that path when there has been some uncertainty as far as valuations in the market. the The negatives or the cons are at least for convertible notes, it's debt. It's actually a loan. You're taking a loan from the investor, and it's it's treated as as debt. So it typically has a maturity date at a point in time when that loan needs to get repaid. And there's, it, it, I, I call it an extra liquidation preference because because it's debt and the lender or the investor is a creditor lender, they're going to get paid first. If there's some sort of liquidation event, before any of the shareholders will get paid, 
the holders of those notes, those convertible notes, since they are creditors with debt, they will get paid before the shareholders do. So that's a positive for the investors because sometimes the investors want to have that extra protection as a creditor, but it, it sometimes can be seen as a little bit of a negative for the company because now you've got debt on the books. In, in most cases, investors investing in a startup doing it via a convertible note, don't really have the intention of wanting to get the money repaid with interest because they're not going to get the return on their investment they're looking for. They're looking for the huge return where the company grows and scales and has a wonderful exit. And now they've, they've made a multiple of their initial investment versus just getting paid back the principal and interest. Another question that just came in, which is actually timely with what we're talking about is, um, please advise on startup valuation of a business that is brand centric. Uh, conventional valuation methods don't do justice to the founders. That's it. That's a good question. And and getting into a discussion of valuations can take a whole you know hour or more. But what I'll tell you at this point is, yes, you do need to really do your homework. You really need to make sure you you're coming up with what you think is a good value of the company. When we're talking about doing an investment, and this is very different than if you were going to go and, and sell the company to a buyer. That's that's a different valuation, different negotiation, different process. But with regard to valuing it for an investment, like a venture capital um, investment, there's obviously, there may be some negotiation back and forth with the investor. But yes, you definitely will want to take into consideration the industry you're in, the type of business it is, the business model, um, what the anticipated growth and scalability of, of the business is, the, the kind of revenue projections that you have, it is it is very much focused on a lot of those features. So you might see a totally different valuation with regard to healthcare related or health tech related companies than you might versus a, you know a SaaS based company, because the models are different, the revenue streams are different, um, and hence obviously the valuation is going to be uh, addressed differently as well. Okay, so talking a bit about. The convertible securities with regard to notes you'll typically see a maturity date and interest rate um, again the maturity date it's usually set somewhere between one and three years i've seen as much as five years three years is probably pretty typical it's a, it's enough of a of a date in the future that you typically will want to make sure you're, you're able to do your price to equity round within that period because then of course it converts into equity and you don't have to repay the note you don't want to have it so short that now you have to deal with an impending maturity date. You haven't had time to go out and raise your, your actual price to equity round. So now you have to go back to the, the note holder and say, you know, we set this maturity date at six months. I haven't been able to raise the financing yet. Can we extend it? And then you're at the mercy of the investor if they want to extend or if they've got other things going on with their investment strategy and profile, they may say, you know what? I really don't want to. I just want to get repaid my money, which, of course, for a startup means you're you're in some hot water because you usually don't have the money to be able to repay those notes. So make sure you've planned a long enough maturity date to be able to to cover that. Interest rates, um, I've seen them all over the place. They're they're generally on the lower end again because the lenders on convertible notes are not looking to make a return on their investment by just getting principal and interest back. So they're not looking for a high interest rate. They don't want necessarily a high interest rate um, because it's all going to be converted at the next round. So I've usually seen anywhere from four to six to eight percent. Um, you got to make sure you check the interest rates to make sure you're at least at the, at the minimum level required by the, the, the feds. So they don't impute interest if you do it too low. But that's generally the rates that I've seen. Conversion terms, it, it, we talked a little bit about this. I've been talking mostly about when it converts on your next priced equity round. But you also want to be careful because there could be other circumstances where it converts. For example, if the company uh, goes through liquidation, either because it can't move forward and it's got to basically liquidate and, and shut its doors, or because maybe you've done such an incredible job with the technology that you get a buyer and it's a really good deal and you want to take it. So that would be considered a, a deemed liquidation event. You're selling the company. And at that point, even though there hasn't been a price to equity round that they're not going to convert at that next round because you're not going to do a round you're going to sell the company before you have to do your round then there'd be typically a provision that allows it to be converted in connection with the sale of the company amendment terms i'm going to just spend a minute or two if you're going out and, and basically getting one note from one investor not really anything to worry about you can amend the note if you need to as long as the lender and the company agree 
But what happens oftentimes, you'll go out and talk to a bunch of investors and get maybe five, six, seven, eight, ten investors, and they'll each put in a little amount via convertible note. So what happens if, say, six months from now, you decide you need more of a, you, know, you need a longer maturity date, you need to go and extend that maturity date, or you need to go and change some particular term. If you haven't included in the in the document ways to amend it by getting a majority in interest to amend, then basically you got to go out to every single note holder and get them to amend the note before you can amend it. Otherwise, you can't amend it for that particular investor versus putting a provision in the agreement that said, look, as long as we get a majority in interest to amend, we can amend and everyone else, even if they haven't signed it, they're never, nevertheless gonna be governed by the amended um, note. So something to be thinking about. The, rema the remaining terms, I'm not gonna go through other terms you might might run into on a convertible note, but the, the ones I've talked about are, are typically the conversion terms, interest rate, maturity rate, amendment of the terms. Those are, are some of the bigger um, uh, ticket items to be thinking about. So let me pause here for a moment and, and switch over and, and talk a little bit about safes. So safes are another vehicle, another instrument by which companies oftentimes will raise financing. And safe is the acronym. It sounds for it stands for a simple agreement for future equity. It was initially created by y, y Combinator back, I think, in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And it was it, it came about as a way to help startups raise money quickly, less expensively and without a lot of the negotiation back and forth between investors and the company. So they created a very simple instrument. I think it's three, four pages. And it's it's a very easy way, as I said earlier, to, to go out and raise money because it is very short. It's very quick to, to put together. And y, y Combinator has done a really nice job. They've got a, a great set of model forms on their website, a lot of great explanations about how to use it and what the terms mean and things like that. But it really has become sort of the market leader so you could very easily download the Y Combinator form. Um, I, I always encourage everyone to go and get good you know, counsel to advise on any sort of financing. There's a lot of other issues we'll talk about, but you could download that form. There isn't a, really a lot to negotiate. And within a very short period of time, have an, a document that you go out and raise financing with, raise money with. But it's different than a convertible note because it's not typically treated as debt. There's no maturity date. There's not not a particular date and time when you've got to pay back the principal and interest. There's no interest typically. So it's it's purely an instrument that would take an investment. It converts based on the, the terms of the safe when you then do your next price equity round or what we refer to in, in is in the document as the next qualified financing or next financing. It's, it's a, a defined term in the safe agreement. And as long as the threshold is met, then when you do that financing, the safe will convert into shares of that next financing. So you want to make sure you pay attention to what that defined term is, because that's going to dictate what you should be hitting as far as your next financing, because you probably do want those safes to convert at your next financing. So then they become equity. You, you no longer have the safes on, on your um, cap table. Everyone's been converted and now you've got um, your, your financing done and they've converted into shares of that financing. Oftentimes what I've seen is a minimum size. Um, it can be all over the place, but you don't wanna set the, the minimum size too low because you might go and do some bridge financing or some additional financing um, where you sell some stock on a, on a very quick basis to generate some, some uh, money to be able to keep the company running. For example, you might even go and some of the founders might put in some money to, to uh, keep the, the company going and buy more stock. So you wouldn't want to trip or trigger the conversion in that scenario. You really want to have it convert when you do your actual next financing, where you've gone out the third party investors that are putting money in the company. The, the convertible notes and safes can each have what's called a discount rate. And this is one of the benefits for the investors. They're coming in at an earlier stage, typically, and investing, maybe taking a little bit more risk. So they oftentimes will want either a discount rate or a conversion price cap, or also called evaluation cap. And I'll go over those in a minute. The discount rate basically means they're gonna get the stock that you sell at your next financing that triggers the conversion at a discount. So as, as a simple example, let's say you, you sign a safe today or a convertible note that has a discount rate of 80%. Six months later, you go out, you raise your first financing, you do a series seed, you sell stock to investors at a, a dollar a share. 
the the safe will convert or the convertible note will convert but it's going to convert at a purchase price per share of 80 cents because they're getting a 20 percent discount on the price of the shares being sold in that series seed financing so it's attractive to them to make this investment because they're going to be able to buy the stock cheaper than what's being sold to the investors later on the valuation cap works a little differently but basically it provides the same sort of effect it gives the investors that are investing via convertible note or a safe the ability to get the stock at a lower price than the investors in that next qualified financing and essentially it works where you establish a, a cap on the valuation so that if you then go out and sell stock to investors your series seed and let's say you have at that point in time you've now done a, a valuation and you say the um pre-money valuation the uh, pre-money valuation of the company is 10 million and let's say you had negotiated a valuation cap of fifth of five million on the safe that you issued then what would happen is you would do the calculation of, of the price per share that the safe holder that's converting will pay based upon 5 million instead of 10 million so essentially they're going to get the stock at half price to what the investors in the series seed financing will be paying for it so that's something to certainly to keep in mind it makes it again attractive for these two types of convertible securities because oftentimes investors want that sort of a a sweetener or that sort of a, of a, a discount early on because they're taking higher risk there's other other provisions about change of control if there's a sale or liquidation of the company that will trigger conversion oftentimes in some cases there could be optional um, conversion at maturity so if you're talking about a note even a safe you know, within a certain period of time, if the company hasn't concluded it, uh, its next financing, then the holders of the safe or the note could have the option to then convert it into equity based upon some calculation or, or some provision that dictates how the fair market value will be determined. Because if you're not doing a financing and yet you want to convert, you have to come up with a price that the stock is going to be worth so you know what you're converting into. So sometimes there'll be provisions that'll say, you know, the board of directors will determine the price the two parties get together and determine it you hire an independent valuation firm to determine it. there's lots of ways to do it but essentially there'd be a valuation established even though there's no financing and then it would convert at that so moving on now to talk about capitalization and let me go back and see if we've got a couple of questions here Yeah, I'll save those questions for it for the end. There's some questions about um, legal tech and stuff, and I'll, I'll try to address those. Um, one, let me let me do address this one. So question about in today's economic climate, um, do you think interest rates would be a decent point? Um, well, it's certainly something to keep in mind, because if you're going to go out, for example, and do a convertible note, you're probably going to see a higher higher interest rate on the convertible note than you might have seen a year or two years ago. But again, it, for a convertible note, I, I wouldn't focus so much on the interest rate because, you know, nine out of ten times, it's not going to get to a point where the investors are going to want their money back. They're going to want to convert because that's how they get their return on investment. Um, totally separate discussion if you're if you're looking to do a loan or something like that. But but something to be aware of. So talking a little bit about capitalization. You know, I titled this, you know, under capitalization to give or not give. What's going to be really important when you're setting up your company is how do you allocate equity amongst the founders? And I've seen a whole bunch of scenarios play out over the years where it's done the right way or done the wrong way and all sorts of problems can come from it. What I'll tell you is if you have more than just one founder, two, three, four, whatever the case may be, take the time and really sit down and discuss all the potential issues that you think might come up from the two, three, four of, of you working together. You know, think of it as getting into a relationship, you know, you're, you're dating someone, you're gonna get married. All of the issues that can come become important down the road are gonna be super critical to discuss upfront before you've done anything in creating this company. So work ethic, um, you know, how much is, is each person contributing? What are they contributing? You know what are the expectations all of those issues and and then some should be discussed and considered and taken into um, some sort of plan on how you're going to manage all of that and based upon that is when you know you would then come back and say all right what's what's a appropriate allocation there's no there's no rule about it it's really how the founders decide 
But generally speaking, as far as some broad brush strokes of what I've seen and talked to clients about over the years is, you know, look at ownership control, you know, look at what each person is is going to be contributing. So as an as an example, you've got two founders. One founder is contributing all the capital, you know, initially, and the other the other founder is going to be contributing um, contacts, network, um, you know, ability to potentially raise money down the road. And they're both equally contributing technology. They both are in the tech tech space. They're both contributing and will be building the technology. So when you look at that scenario, the person that's contributing equal portions of the tech, but contributing all of the capital needed versus the person contributing tech and contacts and things like that, you know, I would probably say there might want to be more equity allocated to the person contributing all the capital initially and the tech versus just the tech and some contacts and, and network, because obviously the capital is it's capital. They're pulling money out of their pocket to fund this. The other person isn't doing that. So there should be some balancing of of equity based upon what each person is contributing. You know, we want to be thinking about that because you don't want to have a scenario where it's not done thinking about those pieces and then later on there's some heartburn because one person put all the money in is developing the technology the other person hasn't contributed any any financial you know uh, capital and yet has gotten 50 percent of the company and now there there are some you know issues about how that's going forward so think backwards when planning think about you know the future game what's what's the exit strategy what's the plan six months a year two three four years in the, in the future what do you want ownership to look like, control to look like, and then think about allocating based upon that. Um, also be thinking about with regard to capitalization, you know, when you initially set up your ownership and control, that once you go out and raise capital, you're going to be selling pieces of the company. And typically, you know, the more, the further along you go in this this life cycle, the more and more equity you'll be giving up. So at some point in time, you know, your series C, D, whatever it is, the founders may have a very, very small percentage of the company. But hopefully by that time, the pie has grown significantly. So even though they've got a much smaller slice of it, it actually is worth a lot more than having a larger piece of a much smaller pie. And then obviously you want to incentivize your team. So as you're building your team, you want to be able to allocate equity to employees and consultants that are going to be the ones that ultimately will help will be the backbone of the company and help build the tech, help build your sales team, help build your you know customer uh, service team, whatever the case may be for your business. But they're going to be super important to making sure your company can scale and grow. And you want to make sure you're allocating equity uh, to properly incentivize them. Proper documentation is, is key. Again, making sure you've got the right documents in place. We talked about that earlier, so I'm not going to go over it again other than to just to say when investors are coming in and doing their diligence, they're going to be looking at all those documents and wanting to make sure you basically basically buttoned up all of those issuances to founders, employees, consultants, so that there's no questions that are unanswered with regard to good corporate hygiene. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. OK, so let's talk a little bit about foundational basics about valuation and dilution. I'm going to go over some terms. You may already be familiar with these. And if you are, apologies for going over them again. But if you're not familiar with them, it's really important to understand some of these terms because they will come up over and over and over again. And it'll be helpful for you to know how to be thinking about these with regard to different agreements, whether it's a term sheet, your financing documents, or you know, down the road um, as you're building your company. So pre-money valuation, that's the value the company has that you've decided upon before your next round of investment. So if you're going out to raise money before you've taken any, any investment and you've decided on, on the valuation, that's called your pre-money valuation. Pre-money, before money, before the investments come in. Post-money, just like it sounds, that's after the, the investment has been made. So that's referred to as post-money. So the, the um, post-money plus the investment, uh, the, sorry, the pre-money plus your investment equals your post-money valuation. Issued and outstanding basis, basically that is the shares of stock that are issued and outstanding um, as of the day you're looking at it. So today you pull up your cap table and there are two founders and maybe one early employee and all three of you have some stock in the company. That's your issued and outstanding basis is the total number of shares that have been, have been issued to the two founders and the employee. 
they they were issued the shares, they still are holding the shares, so it's outstanding. That's what issued and outstanding means. The other term that's important is is fully diluted, and <clears throat> there isn't one um, definitive definition for this. Typically, what it means is you take all of the stock that's issued and outstanding, so the, the definition of right immediately above, plus you add to that any securities that can be converted to common stock. So typically that's going to be if you've issued options, options typically convert. You know, once you exercise that option, you purchase common stock. So it's a convertible security because it, it would be then you'd purchase, you would be purchasing common stock. So you would take the options, warrants are similar to an option, um, and you would basically assume that it's all been exercised and those shares have been purchased. And then you tally up the total number of those shares and that gives you your fully diluted basis. You know, if you have convertible notes or you have safes, um, uh, oftentimes you might take those into consideration as well. It really depends on, on how this is being used. If you're using it to determine ownership and you're looking at your cap table and you want to know, OK, you know, what's my ownership percentage on a fully diluted basis? Then you would look at typically issued outstanding stock. You look at options, warrants, um, convertible notes. Um, maybe safes, maybe not. And then you would calculate all that out and that would give you your percentage on a fully diluted basis. It's important to know this term and to be careful with how it's defined because you'll see this term oftentimes in convertible notes, in safes, and you may see it, you'll see it, you know, um, sometimes in term sheets on the financing. And you want to make sure that that you're understanding what all is being included in fully diluted so that when you go to calculate what that ownership is going to look like, you've done the calculation properly and you've accounted for all of the different convertible securities that need to be assumed as if they were converted into shares to then be able to run your calculation to determine percentages. Because they're not they're not all the same. The definition can can vary and, and the result obviously will will vary based upon that. OK, so I'm going to run through a couple of very, very simple examples. I want to get move on and get to some of the rest of the um, materials for today. So just taking a very simple example, if you have a pre-money valuation of $10 million and that, so you have 10 million shares issued and outstanding amongst three different founders, all equal ownership, then for example, founder A will have 3,333,333 shares or 33% of the company. Let's say you then go and you raise $3 million at a dollar a share then you would take the $10 million pre-money valuation divided by the, the total number of shares that are issued and outstanding, and <clears throat> basically your post-money valuation would be $13 million, but that gets you your, your um, uh, valuation and your price point. And then if you look at founder A with their share ownership, um, after the investment goes through, they will end up with approximately 25% of the company. So whereas before they had 33%, Right, you had 10, 10 million shares split amongst three founders. Each of them has 33%. Once you take on that initial investment of 3 million at a buck a share, you now have a post money valuation of 13 million. Then when you do the math, the each of the founders is going to get diluted and they're going to end up with about 25% instead of the 33%. So you can see how the dilution you know, impacts obviously the ownership, but it's important to keep that in, in mind as you're going through financing because you always want to, know as a founder especially what is my ownership going to look like you know as a result of this this financing that i'm doing, going to be doing and just making sure you're keeping track of that so you know at a moment's notice you know you can go and say okay i'll end up with approximately 25 percent in this scenario if we take a three million dollar investment so here's another quick example if you're looking at a convertible note so let's say let's say there had been uh, $450,000 as, as a convertible security with a 25% discount. So in that scenario, the holder would, would receive 600,000 shadow shares, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Basically, 600,000 shares, when you do the math, based on a $450,000 investment on a convertible security that has a 25% discount. If you take another example and you assume the same investment amount of 450000 but now instead of a discount, you're talking about a valuation cap of five million. Um, and let's say that the valuation is done at 10 million 
and your financing, then based upon on the math, you would come up with that investor getting 900,000 shares because the valuation that was arrived at for the financing is higher, 10 million, versus the valuation cap that was negotiated for that instrument at 5 million, so essentially half of the value. So they would then get the stock at, a, at a more stock based upon that than they would if they'd gotten a discount. So it, it sort of emphasizes the importance of when you're negotiating, you know, the importance of the discount versus the valuation cap, which is going to be better for the company, meaning less shares going out, meaning less dilution for the founders versus what are the investors going to be looking for, i.e. more shares for them, more ownership for them, better discount on the price that they're going to get when it converts. So talking a little bit about overview of venture financings, and this is just some some thoughts to keep in mind, you know, obviously, and I'm sure everybody knows this, making sure you've got a good, credible business plan. It should have milestones. Make sure you perfect your pitch. You basically have one shot with the investor and you've got a matter of seconds to really captivate them and interest them. You know, if you go to your, your typical sophisticated investor, they're seeing pitches, they're, they're seeing business plans and slide decks, you know, multiple times a, a day, week, month. So they get inundated with all sorts of things. So you need to stand out amongst the crowd and it can be very difficult to do that. One of the ways you can do that is just making sure you've got a really solid business plan or, or slide deck. It's got, it's very easy to read, very easy to understand what the business is. It also talks to what the investors are interested in. And your your pitch is done really, really well, very succinct to the point. It's it's animated, meaning it's it's a good story to tell, right? I mean, whenever you hear a story, you can very quickly tell who's a really good storyteller and who's not, and, and what you're gonna listen to and what you're gonna tune out. It's it's really the same way. They're they're also looking at the, the verbal and nonverbal cues, how excited you are, are you passionate about your business? Do you understand your business? Things like that. Make sure you run a systematic process. Have have enough capital from your earlier seed rounds that we talked about, the convertible note financing or safe financing to get through your investment where you're selling stock, your price equity round. Connect with the right investors. Don't waste your time on it. Talk to investors that aren't in your space that that typically don't invest in, in your type of company because they're just not the right investor. Um, understand what your ideal term sheet is so you know the terms in advance of sitting down with an investor because they will know their term sheet better than you could ever possibly know it. So you need to level the playing field. And one of the ways you can do that is is making sure you do your homework and understand it, but also making sure you've got good a good uh, attorney who's done a lot of these type of deals, who understands the space, understands you know these type of financings to help you make sure you get the best deal you can. Have good corporate hygiene. We'll talk about a little bit more in a minute about having good corporate records. They're clean. They there isn't any gaps or missing information or missing documents. And be prepared for cleanup. If if things were missed or didn't get done properly, believe me, the the investors are going to see that and they're going to want to make sure that it gets cleaned up. So ge the general overview of sort of the the venture capital financing um, and understanding your ideal term sheet. These are some of the things that. You'll want to be thinking about, want to be aware of, want to understand how they all work and function when you sit down to negotiate your, your initial term sheet. How much of the company is being sold? You know, what are the dividends being offered? I mean, dividend essentially, it's it's where a shareholder will get paid a, a certain percentage based upon the number of shares that they have. Um, it's it's important because you'll see it in, in the term sheet. Oftentimes, you'll see it in, in the financing documents. It's not something that... <clears throat> I think investors are, for the most part, super concerned about because, yes, it, it gives them more money ultimately, but there, there are more important things to be focusing on negotiating, such as liquidation preferences. <clears throat> Your liquidation preference is essentially the preference that the investor will get on their, on their stock. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're buying preferred stock, which by its terms will come with certain rights, preferences, privileges. Those preferences will give them to write to receive monies, <clears throat> in some cases, before the common shareholders receive anything. So how that's negotiated is going to be important. Oftentimes, you'll see a, a 1x liquidation preference, which essentially means if there's a sale of the company or a liquidation event, from the proceeds, the investors will get the money that they invested back before any other money is, is distributed out to the common shareholders. 
And there's a lot of ways this comes up in the agreements. Sometimes it's it's just as I mentioned, they get their money back and that's it. Uh, other times it's they get their money, they get the greater of their money back on their investment or whatever they would get if they convert it to common. So if they convert it to common, and, and let's say you did the math and figured out, okay, they've got now 10% of the company um, and there was a $100 million sale, you know, they're going to get $10 million. Is that number bigger than if they invested, let's say, $5 million and they got their one times their liquidation preference, their one times their investment, they get $5 million. Obviously, it's better for them to convert into common and get $10 million versus just getting the return of their investment, their $5 million. So you'll see a lot of those kind of provisions in, in the documents as well. But it's basically designed to make sure the investors are going to get back some sort of return on their investment. Voting rights are important, too. Um, what are the voting rights? What approvals do you need from the different series or classes of stock? Are there protective provisions which are important to, to really be aware of? Because those are the protective provisions for the investors. So that means essentially there are certain things the company can't do without getting the investor's approval. And sometimes it's a, a certain percentage threshold approval you need. So maybe it's majority of the series seed or series A investors need to approve X, Y, and Z from happening in the company. For example, you want to sell a company. Well, you can't do it unless a majority of the series A approve the sale of the company, things like that. Usually bigger, bigger events, bigger decisions, decisions that typically the investors think of as impacting or potentially affecting their investment in the company. Optional and mandatory conversions. So preferred stock, which is typically what a venture capital um, investor is going to get, will convert based upon some conversion um, metrics that are laid out in the documentation. But what are those, those conversions and when can the stock convert from typically the preferred series that it is, series C, series A, et cetera, into common stock? Is there anti-dilution protection so that if you go out and issue a whole bunch of other shares, can the existing investors be protected so that they get the right to purchase additional shares to, to keep their percentage ownership equal? Um, or if you go and sell stock at a lower price than they purchased it, can is there some protection for them so that um, their stock can be repriced at the same price that you go out and sell at a lower price? All sorts of features to protect their investment in that scenario as well. The documentation, um, you'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Attorney's fees, oftentimes you'll see, especially VC investors looking to get um, a certain amount of their fees paid by the company fairly typical ask. You'll see no shop and confidentiality provisions, which are important, and those typically you'll want to be binding versus the rest of the term sheet oftentimes is not binding because you don't want to have necessarily be bound to an agreement that hasn't fleshed out all of the details of the terms. But what you do want to be binding, at least from the company's perspective, is the confidentiality provision so that the investors and anyone else signing that term sheet can't go out and suddenly talk about this uh, company, the details or anything like that. From the investor's perspective, the no shop or exclusivity is important because they they sign a term sheet with you. They want to know that you're not going to go shop around and try to find a better deal and then say, yeah, see you later, investor A. I got a better deal from investor B because then they lose out on that opportunity. And then whether or not investors will have a board seat, whether they'll have observer rights, what sort of information, the rights they'll have. All of that is typically um, oftentimes spelled out in the term sheet or at least referenced in the term sheet. And then obviously you'll you'll have that in the in the uh, definitive agreements. Next. So with regard to documenting a venture capital financing, we have the term sheet, which is essentially like it says, it's a term sheet. It's it's a sheet, one or two page, it could be a little bit more in some cases, where it lays out all of the general terms, not in, in definitive details but enough details to know what the deal is. And then from that, once that's agreed upon, then the company's counsel and the investor's counsel will go and then draft all the financing documents, the definitive agreements for that. There's also gonna be a diligence process usually that kicks off right after the term sheet's signed. So the company needs to be ready. They're gonna you know, typically create an interim, provide documents to the investor, investor's counsel to look at and review, answer questions, and go through that process to make sure that the investor is comfortable with knowing the company well enough to say, okay, yes, there aren't any skeletons in the closet or red flags to be worried about. Now I'm ready to go forward. And once the definitive terms are all agreed upon, sign the documents and close. With regard to the documents, 
you can get a good sense of what typically is is the market sort of model forms that are used. And those were generated by the National Venture Capital Association. The, the website is there. You can go check it out. There's a lot of good information on the website. But what's really great is they, they've prepared these model forms over years of, of vetting um, by uh, venture capital firms as well as lawyers. And they've come up with a really nice set of model forms. And those typically are the starting point for most of these type of venture capital financings because they've already been done. They've already been vetted they are typically seen to be marked in a lot of the terms that they have. So it's a really good starting point. Um, there are some other ones as well. Series Seed has its own version. Is it sort of a watered down, shorter version of documents? Um, not used as, as often, but in some cases for a smaller deal, that that's another um, place that sometimes parties will go to for their documents. And some law firms have their own proprietary forms. But by far and large, you'll see the Nantra, National Venture Capital Association forms being the ones that are used in, in most of the uh, financings. The pre-closing is making sure you understand what is necessary for closing, making sure all of those are being addressed. Are there approvals needed from, if you've got any loans from a bank, did the bank has to, does the bank have to sign off on a financing? Are there other approvals necessary? You need obviously board consent, stockholder consent, all of those issues being managed prior to closing. The closing then would be happening. Documents are signed, wire instructions provided, then the investors typically wire their funds. And then you, you've closed your transaction. And then there oftentimes are post-closing items that need to be taken care of as well, making sure you've got security exemptions, filings that are done, preparing a closing set. Uh, you need to give notice if, if it's a Delaware Corp, if there are shareholders that didn't consent to the transaction, then you oftentimes need to send notice to those. So there's some post-closing items that oftentimes will, will need to be taken care of. Okay, we're almost through the materials and I know we're at 10.04 and I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions. So I'll wrap up in a minute or two. So here's a topic I think is, is really important. I, I don't think it gets enough attention, especially by companies as they're starting to, to get ready for their financing. And it's really getting investment ready, as I call it. And, and what does that mean? It means putting the company in the best position so that you can have a streamlined process to closing, that you can anticipate Oftentimes, what sort of things the investor is going to want to know, going to want to see, if it's organized, if there are some corporate cleanup issues that it can get um, taken care of beforehand. And all of that is designed to make the whole process much more efficient, much more effective, and less costly. I can't tell you how many times on, on transactions, stuff will come up where the company didn't document something properly. There's missing documents. There are all sorts of other issues that the investor starts to ask about because they're they're looking for stuff. And it, it leads to an exercise of scrambling to find the document. In some cases, you have to go back and create the document. You have to go back and create board minutes or ratify board actions. Um, you have to go and, and make sure that, for example, all the employees and consultants have, and founders have signed those agreements. I talked to you about at the beginning of the presentation, the confidential information invention assignment agreements that you don't have any scenario where you had a founder that walked away with 30 percent of the company because they, they left after three months but you didn't have the right documents so now you don't have that 30 percent back at the company they they're not participating and they've got 30 percent all of those can be you know will be raised as potential issues and flags by investors so making sure you've handled all that in advance will save you a ton of time effort and and fees because oftentimes what happens is as the lawyers on the transaction, we get called upon to help fix and, and resolve all these. And it, it takes time and obviously money to do that. So this will help tremendously in keeping your legal spend down. Um, so documentation in order, make sure you've got the documents to support your cap table. One of the things the investors will do is do what's typically called a cap table tie-out. They'll go through your cap table and, and make sure that every statement in that cap table can be supported by documentation. So if you say, you know, you've got three founders and each founder owns, you know, X percent of the company. They're going to be looking for the board consent approving the issuance of the stock to those founders, the stock purchase agreement, documenting the issuance of those shares to the founders. They will be looking for if there was a, a security exemption filed, if it needed to be filed for that um, issuance, all of those things. And if they can't find them, then they can't rely upon the cap table as being accurate. So then they're going to be asking you on the company side okay provide this documentation and if you don't have it then it's it's again a scramble to get it in place sometimes after the fact 
and that can take time and obviously cost money. Setting up a data room, really, really important. I would encourage everyone to set it up from the get-go. One of the things we do with our clients, you know, as soon as we get a client that um, engages us for, for corporate work, we automatically set up a data room for them and we organize it in the way that we know investors are typically looking for um, information so that once they get to a point where they're now ready to raise money, they've got the data room already up. It's been up for a while. It's current because you know we encourage the company to update it regularly. So as they go out and sign agreements and do things that they're also updating the, the data room and it's ready to go and can be opened up to the investor and, and its counsel fairly quickly. Um, maintaining information, as I just mentioned, and then become familiar with the NVCA forms I just talked about. Actually take some time before you actually sign your term sheet and run through those documents. And if you've got questions, you know, reach out and talk to people that have been through the process or, you know, talk to, to your lawyer. But understanding that and doing some research will help you as you start going through that um, process. I always like to think of as you get ready for closing, sort of the ABC, um, always be closing, you know, from this from the time you're thinking about an investment to the time you sign your term sheet what should be in the back of your mind, almost like a mantra is always be closing. I, I always need to be doing whatever I need to do to close the transaction. So do your homework, get your company's house in order, do your diligence, know your potential investors, understand them just like they're, they're trying to understand you and just start preparing and setting things up from day one to get to your closing as effectively, efficiently as, as you possibly can. And set reasonable timelines too. You know, make sure you, you have your internal team that's ready to go. You've got your external team, your lawyers, other advisors, everyone's aligned. You, you discuss and organize and figure out who's doing what so there isn't duplication and there isn't miscommunication. All of that put in place hopefully will make the, the whole process uh, a lot more manageable, a lot more efficient and effective. Next. Okay, I'm going to run through this really quickly. Always available, reach out to me afterwards if you've got questions, but common pitfalls I've seen, I've talked about a num number of them throughout this discussion, but not setting up the right entity, right jurisdiction, not having proper documentation, not complying with securities laws, not having a good cap table where you know you can go and look and know that the, the number of shares that are reflected as you know being owned by X, Y, and Z people are actually accurate. You've got documents to support it, not having a data room set up, um, you know, having side letters that you've signed with other investors that give them certain rights, but it's not part of your main financing documents. And then you misplace the side letter and then you're doing a financing, but you needed to get their approval because you agreed with one investor that, you know, you're going to come to them and get their approval before you raise any more money. Being able to track all that is going to be important. Understanding if there's any employment law issues, classification issues, um, you know, do you have the right documentation as you grow and scale? Be aware that every state has its own employment laws as well as the federal laws. But, you know, you want to make sure you've got the right uh, procedures in place. You know, you're, you're managing all of those issues effectively and, and efficiently and, and in compliance with your, your uh, laws at that state. And then you've also handled any tax related issues as well. Um, OK, do your homework, prepare in advance, dream backwards, look at your ultimate, you know, finish line. That's, you know, when you talk about athletes, they're looking at the finish line. They're looking at crossing the finish line even before the gun goes off. And, and that's what they they visualize and focus on. And, and there's no reason why that shouldn't be the same approach here. It really is like a race. Um, it's just a different kind of race. Next slide, please. OK, so I, I went a little bit over as far as content of the presentation, but let's open this up for some of the questions. Let me go through and I'm going to run through some of the, the uh, chats to make sure that I've got uh, covering all of the questions. For those of you who joined a little bit late, the, the slides, the recording will be made available. So you'll definitely get a, a email and a link to be able to go and watch the presentation and see the slides. Um, we talked about valuations. What tools, services do you suggest for tech startup uh, evaluations? So there's, there's a number of things. Um, there is a uh, cap table management uh, program there's, there's a whole bunch of them, by the way. There's Pulley, there's um, uh, Carta, there, there's a number of others as well. And they really do a really good job of helping you manage your cap table. Some of them will also help you and provide a, a valuation for your company, specifically for um, granting options or, or issuing stock, uh, so-called 409A valuation. I think Carta does that as well if you get the, a particular subscription 
um, rate, then they'll include that as part of the subscription. There are also other companies you can go to that will do valuation specifically for startups that are looking to issue options or grant stock. I didn't go into it too much today, but you know, if you set up a stock plan, option plan, um, you just need to make sure it's set up properly. There are all sorts of, of tax rules and issues that, and securities that need to go into making sure it's done properly. But one of the important things is making sure that if you're if you're granting options or issuing stock, it really should be done at the fair market value of the stock. And that's when you really need to figure out what that is. And, and that leads oftentimes companies to go and get evaluation, a so-called 409A valuation, which refers to the, the IRS code. Um, that establishes what the fair market value is. So if you ever have a question from the IRS about, you know, did you value your options properly? If you went and got a valuation from a third party uh, firm, then you can pull that out and say, yes, I did. There are some exceptions and it's only good for a certain period of time. And obviously that the valuation can change if you do a deal or sell stock at a different price, things like that. But generally speaking, once you get the valuation, you can, you can rely on that um, with regard to issuing options and, and stock. Um, does an investor with a convertible note or safe need to be on the board? That's a good question. No, they don't. Um, the, you know, whether or not an investor gets a board seat or observer seat um, is is really a, a point of negotiation. What I'll tell you though is, obviously, if if the investor is coming in and they're going to be the lead investor and they're writing a pretty significant check, they usually will want to have a board seat. Um, Usually you'll see your more sophisticated investors, you know, oftentimes the venture capital investors, if they're leading the round or co-leading the round or, or investing a large enough amount, they're going to want to have a board seat because that, again, gives them some protection for their investment. If they're sitting on the board, they're going to know what's going on with the company. They're going to get reports from management. They'll have a say so on certain things. And they'll be able to vote. So it's important for them from, a you know, protect your investment standpoint to have a seat. Um, it's also good for the company in a lot of situations, too, because now you've got someone on your board that's, you know, hopefully very knowledgeable about your industry, will become very knowledgeable about the company, typically has a ton of contacts, typically has a lot of experience that they can offer when when issues come up on how to resolve issues or, you know, what markets to go after, you know, how to go after and attract additional investments, all, all sorts of things that they can be tremendously helpful. Um, so oftentimes a good thing. But no, even even with a convertible note or safe, I've seen, again, they would be negotiated, so they do get a board seat. Um, so it really depends on on the size of, of the investment and um, the role that they may play. Okay, so looking at some other questions here. Okay. Is there an optimum number of shares? Is there an optimum number or percentage of shares being sold? Um, that, that's an open-ended question. It, it probably need a little bit more direction on, on what you're asking about. But if you're talking about, you know, you're going out to raise your first financing um, and you're going to be selling shares, so we're not talking about a convertible note or safe. You're actually selling shares. Is there an optimum number? No. I mean, you need to be thinking about going back to earlier in the discussion about you know how much of the company you want to sell what's the the impact going to be on your ownership so what's the dilution going to be on your ownership of the company um, how much money do you actually need to get to the next level so all of those will be factored into coming up with what ultimately you want to sell to an investor as far as a, a piece of the company and that then will dictate and, and of course you know what the valuation of the company is going to be too because that will be used to calculate the purchase price of the shares and and then based upon the investment, the percentage that the investor will be getting in the company. What does it take to get the uh, oh the slides? Yes, the slides and the recording will be made available for you. So um, watch out for a link. Uh, it'll be it'll be made available um, shortly afterwards. Understanding that most startup most pre revenue startups are bootstrapping everything and every expense needs to be mitigated. What's your philosophy on when a company should incorporate? That's a great question. So I would say if you are spending a lot of time doing R&D, developing your technology, you're doing a lot of research, you're, you're building it out, then you may push everything out and not worry about incorporating just yet. Um, but having said that, here are a couple, couple pointers on when you may want to incorporate. So if you are looking to hire anyone, employee, consultant, 
um, advisor, then at that point, that's that's a good indication you you should form a corporation because obviously if they're going to be coming in and you're paying them, if you're going to pay them with equity, you, you have to form a company because that's going to be required. But it also gives you some protection as the founder. You don't want to be exposed if you bring on an employee and, and you haven't formed your entity yet, then you technically the individual will be considered the employer. And so if there's any problems, then all of your personal assets are at risk. They'd be suing you individually and you've got no protection from having a corporate shield that that limited liability um, veil to protect you. If you're obviously going to go out to customers, even if it's early on and you're doing pilot programs, things of that nature, you, you want to have your corporation set up. I typically encourage people to form your company, have it all done before you start going and talking to investors. It's just from an optics perspective, it shows that you're, you've done your homework, you've gotten everything ready. It's, it's again, going back to this concept of being investment ready. If you go to an investor and you haven't even formed your company yet, um, oftentimes the investor may be thinking, okay, well, how serious are you? Because you haven't even bothered to form the company that you now want me to invest in. So I would certainly encourage you to, to incorporate it that, at that time too. Um, was there any taxation issues during the processing? I'm not sure what that question relates to. Um, if you're forming your company, typically that can be done on a, on a tax-free basis because you're putting in um, money in return for equity, and that typically qualifies as, as a tax-free um, transaction. There's, there isn't going to be any tax on, on either side of that. So I don't know if that was what the question was or if there's something else, but, but feel free to reach out to me separately. Um, at what point should we start pat patenting? stuff. So when do you file your patents? That is another great question. Um, uh, I would say, you know, again, uh, talk to talk to an attorney. Um, I work regularly with a lot of our IP, my IP colleagues and bring them in, you know, when I've got startups that are looking to, to file a patent or even if they're not sure if there is something that could be patented or even when to patent, I'll have them come in and talk about it. Because one thing that's really important is if you're developing something that could be patented, and you start going out and talking about it and disclosing some of that, you could potentially blow your opportunity to then go and file for a patent. So there, there's a risk there. So you want to be very careful with what you disclose before you patent something, if it, if it can be patented. And then, of course, you want to obviously be in the best position and protect yourself. So if you do have something that could be patented, um, then it's, it's definitely, you know, go talk to someone right away. Because you don't have to have a corporation to file a patent. You know, if you were the inventor and you came up with the idea, you could file a patent as an individual. You would be listed as the inventor, the owner of the patent. You can then at a later point, once you've formed your company, transfer the patent over to the company. So there is no, there isn't any particular um, timing issue there other than if you think you've got something that could be patented, talk to a patent attorney and then go from there. They're not, they're not cheap to file patents. But there are some strategies that can be done. There are some ways to try to keep the prices down a bit on, on filing. But filing is going to be critical, and you want to do it as soon as you can because you want to at least make sure you can try to protect your, your patent, if your technology, as much as you can. So if you've got something that you're looking at, anyone on, on, this, uh, on this call, this meeting, feel free to reach out, um, and we can make sure we have a call, and I can set you up with one of my IP colleagues to answer questions on that. Okay, so let me see what other questions. Any cautions around using finders? Yes, I would say be very cautious. Finders are, you know, there is a way to be a finder and be a finder legally, but it's 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 very difficult to do so. It's a, it's almost a razor's edge that the finders have to walk. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail on, on the regulations, but essentially, you know, finders have to be careful that they're not doing anything that requires them to be licensed as an investment advisor, as a broker, or things of that nature, because there are all sorts of laws that come into play to say, look, if you're going to be advising someone on an investment, then then you need to be licensed or you need to have the right credentials. And there are a number of different um, credentials out there that allow a, a company or an individual to provide investment advice, but it, it's got to be done properly. So finders typically <clears throat> used to be able, used to be limited to just, and I think they still are, essentially basically making an introduction and that's it. They can't negotiate the deal. They can't make representations about the deal. They shouldn't be making any sort of representations about what an investor can make or what the investment potential is. All of that stuff falls into what's considered investment advice. And that's typically something that you need to make sure you've got the proper licenses um, in order to do. So 
you know, using finders um, from a company standpoint, I would say be careful because, you know, you should be able to go out with your network, your friends and family, other people you've talked to, you know, find some introductions to investors that may be interested in your company. You know, the the, the downside with using finders is they're going to want a percentage of whatever they, they raise for you. And do you really need to pay a percentage of that um, to raise the money? In some cases, maybe the answer is yes. Um, in some cases, you may not need it. So I would I would be very cautious with with using finders. Um, yes, for those of you that missed the recording, it will be made available. Um, any books, resources to read up on raising capital? Is there any online community? There there are a lot of there's a ton of resources. So the, the first thing I'll tell you is is go to our website fully.com. We have a, a section of our um, uh, website or you can just go to Foley Ignite. I think it's www.foleyignite.com that we've created and curated a ton of material specifically for sort of the, the startup and investment e ecosystem. It's got a lot of other stuff too. It talks about M&A and you know, exits and things like that. But but we, we do put a lot of content up there, including I think we also have some document generators. So we created a, a process by which you can create some very simple documents. If you need a quick NDA or things like that, I think we can we have that facility so you can go in and, and quickly do that. But there are a lot of resources there, a lot of articles, a lot of things that, that we've put up there to help um, people that are interested in learning a little bit more. OK. Um, just making sure I run through these. OK, why is it that investors get offended when startup founders are pitching and the founders pitch with a confident, bold valuation? Even when it is somewhat justified, they consider it too high for a pre-money valuation, um, i.e. Shark Tank investors laugh when a company presents to them 3.5 million ask for 20%. Um, <laughs> that's that's a good, uh, a very good uh, question and point. What I would say is, is if you've done your homework and you really can support it, and I mean support it with actual, you know, reputable sources, then there's nothing wrong with being confident. You just don't want to be overconfident and come across as being arrogant. So, you know, keep in mind, if you're pitching to investors and you want them to write a check, they're ultimately going to have the say so on what value they're going to give your company. You can argue with them all day, but if they're writing the check, they're going to tell you, I will invest and this is the value I think your company has. Now, if you continue to argue with them, then you run the risk of, of turning them off so that they're just not interested. You know, one of the reasons be behind that may be they're also, as you're pitching and as you're getting to know you, they're also assessing you as, as a potential partner, right? They are going to become your partner because they're going to invest money in the company and they're going to be with you for the ride, right alongside, hopefully as you grow and scale and, and ultimately end up doing an exit where they're going to make a return on their investment. So all of the metrics need to make sense. The technology needs to make sense. They need to see the scalability of the company, but they also need to know that you're the type of person that they can work with. And if you come across as, as overly confident and what I'll call as arrogant, and you keep arguing with them and you know shoot down their, their ideas and what you, they think the valuation is, that may turn them off because they may be thinking, look, this guy is gonna be very, this lady or gentleman is gonna be very difficult to work with. We just don't wanna deal with it. We've got a ton of other offers. We don't have to invest. So we wanna invest for all the other reasons I mentioned, but also they're they're looking to invest with people they really want to work with because they're going to spend a ton of time if they sit on the board they're going to be attending board meetings they don't want to be spending time with someone that they just don't like or or that they think is going to be very difficult to work with that may be the reason why you've heard that feedback before but i think you can do that in a very respectful way and and you know put your point across provide your support in some cases you know you may be successful in getting them to to change their particular evaluation if it was an initial evaluation that came up with you just got to do it in, in a sort of a, a a sensitive way so you don't offend them my team and i paid 25 to 30 000 on our software utility patent um worth it though okay well that's, that's good to hear i mean it can be expensive in some cases it can be um worth every penny um do you help with innovation labs for work visa entrepreneurs? Yeah, we actually do have a we have an immigration team, so we oftentimes work hand in hand for for companies that are outside the U.S. and founders that are outside the U.S. that want to come and work in the U.S. We actually have a whole immigration team at Foley that can help with that. So definitely reach out to me um, separately. Um, the site to go to it, it, if you go to www.foley.com. Um, you should be able to navigate through our site to get to Foley Ignite, but it's Foley Ignite. So it's Foley, 
I-G-N-I-T-E.com. I think it's it's www.foleyignite.com. But if you type in Foley Ignite in Google, you should be able to come up with that uh, website. we got a couple more minutes left. What are the main challenges, key aspects for pre-revenue getting a deal with an angel? Um, well, one of the things I'll tell you is oftentimes investors on a pre-revenue company are looking to make sure that they're looking to see, don't have revenue yet, but I believe the technology is something that's going to make a ton of revenue and it's going to be very successful. So it, it's going to be really their ability to look and assess and see tremendous value on what's been created, even though you haven't in, you don't have any revenues yet. Um, there are investors that look at pre-revenue companies and invest in pre-revenue pre -revenue companies all the time. That's going back to what I said about get to know your investor. Some investors do that. Some investors don't. Some investors will say, you know, my threshold is you got to have a million in uh, annual recurring revenue in order for me to be interested. So it really depends on on what their investment um, profile uh, is for uh, investing in startups. Okay, let me see if I can try to get one more. Um, best tax election for early stage startups. It's if you're looking to raise money by investors, then typically you're going to want to set it up as a C corporation, which is what it's, that's the default setup. You have to actually go and file a special election to be treated as an S-Corp. But whenever you create a corporation, if you don't do anything else, it'll automatically be a, a C-Corp. Um, what resources are there for capital raisers to learn properly how to raise money for your startup? Give me a call. I, I will talk to you about this uh, separately, but I can also give you some additional resources. But our website's a good resource, and there's some other resources as well. Okay, I think I covered all the questions. If for some reason I forgot or missed a few, um, by all means, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you have my contact information. This was a, a delight to be able to uh, present to you, and um, thank you for a lot of your, your very kind comments and responses. Hopefully, everyone got something out of this. Um, I love working with startups, love working with investors. Um, so happy to, to talk to you uh, separately if you've got questions or need any help that uh, me or my, my firm can help you with. Um, but again, thank you so much. I, I know this is a big time out of your day, so I appreciate your joining in. And if again, last time, if you didn't get a chance to see the whole presentation, it will be made available to you. So if you're registered, we have your email. We'll send out a, a, a blast afterwards with a link to the recording. Thank you again, and I hope to see you uh, on another presentation. Take care.